Maker's Hill. Cut and Shoot, Texas. Population, 4,352. 20 years later. Jags walked up the driveway toward his father's house, hoping the next 40 or so minutes wouldn't end up being a waste of time. Dad was worried about Cam, the eldest of Jags' brothers. And when Dad worried, he could be quite dramatic, overreacting to situations most would find mundane and ordinary. If Jags was lucky, this might be one of those moments. And if this situation was like the others, Dad would simply fix himself a cup of honey lavender tea. And before he could empty the mug, whatever had gotten him worked up would pass, and with no lasting effects on anything or anybody. Cam was actually Jags' stepbrother, but they had dropped the step a long time ago. Their blood ran thicker than Ken. Same with the other brother, AJ. Jags couldn't even remember what Cam, AJ, and his mom's last name had been before. Because as long as he could remember, they'd always been the Wolf family. Since Gramps had been slowly losing his mind over the past year, Dad had assumed Gramps' position as head of the family. It was his job to make sure the three brothers stayed out of trouble. But Dad was out of town a lot. He volunteered with the Peace Corps and was oftentimes halfway across the planet. Jag swung the door open to his father's modest home. He moved down the hall, past a dozen or so framed photographs. The photographs showcased his father's life off and on numerous stints. In Senegal, he had learned French and how to build a tree nursery for live fencing. For three years, he taught rudimentary algebra in Liberia. And most recently, he had spent several months tossing sandbags in Guyana. Quite impressive for a 56-year-old man. Douglas Wolf was a saint, simple as that. Jags could not be prouder of his father. Jags approached the kitchen, hoping to see his father nursing a cup of tea in his trademark Smokey the Bear mug. But when Jags turned into the kitchen, he noticed a dull and most forgettable white mug in his father's hand. Dad paced, swiping the back of his free hand across his sweaty forehead. Nothing about him seemed calm, cool, or collected. Dad? Thank the Maker. You're here. He shoved his cell phone at Jags. Jags pushed play and put it on speakerphone. Hey, uh, can you, uh, check in on Gramps? I gotta go out of town. For a while. I'd asked you, Hags, but you know him. He has a hard time parallel parking. Never mind keeping all of Gramps medication straight. Anyway, I left a notebook on the coffee table with detailed, uh, very detailed instructions on preparing his favorite snacks. And, and I, I left, um, some pre-made snacks in the bottom drawer of the fridge. But, but don't tell Gramps. Or he'll eat them all at once and he'll screw up his sugar. Oh, and, and don't use garlic when cooking. It, it gives him the shits. Also, if he's not in his rocker when you get there, then he's probably in the back room. He's been tinkering with those old TV sets. And he doesn't like to be interrupted, so you better knock before going in. Else, <laughs> Gramps gets real cranky. I guess it's his me time, you know. And don't be surprised if some old folk from the VA randomly drop by. I swear they're they're worse than a Jehovah Witness, but they're harmless. Usually just bring him another TV to work on. Oh, and somebody is feeding Gramps cigarettes, so if you can find out who it is, please. Find out. So he didn't say where he was going? There's more. Keep listening. Um, anyways, just drop by and, you know, keep him company. 
will you? And, and tell him, uh, I love him. And, yeah, you know, uh, I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. And, well, fuck. Um, tell, uh, tell Jags I love him, too. Because, <laughs> uh, I know he'll hear this message sooner rather than later, so... Hey, I gotta go. <laughs> uh, take care. And, uh, thanks. I, um, uh, I love you. I love you. And, yeah, that's it, I guess. I'll see ya. Bye. You don't think. What do you think? When did he leave the message? Yesterday. Yesterday? I know he's got a head start, but you can find him, right? He could be... Ah, uh, Maker's Hell. I know, I know. Jags knew he was the only one who could put his father's worries to rest. Because Jags was an empath. With skin-on-skin -skin touch, Jags could read a person. Not as clearly as the written word of a book but more like the vague recollection of a dream. This is a phone, Dad. Can't read metal. Only people. I know, I know. There's only one place he would go. Don't worry. I'll find him. I know you will. He opened the glove compartment. Several packages of gum spilled onto the floor. He passed on the package of airwaves, a British gum with eucalyptus and menthol. Flung the tin of foyer gras, a bubble gum that tasted like the French entree of fatty goose liver. Ironically, no animals were harmed in the manufacturing of this gum. It was printed right there on the package. Jags went with a piece of Mexican Motitas banana gum. He racked his brain, trying to reason why after all this time, Cam would. I swear, Cam, if you've done anything stupid, I'll kick your ass from and back to the maker. The F-350 roared faster down the country road. as it swerved to follow signs to Sam Houston State Park. The snub-nosed revolver rested next to Maggie Stewart on the bench seat of the aluminum boat. Her brother Eric's words echoed in her mind. Always control the muzzle. Point it up or point it down. Guns are dangerous, sis, but not nearly as dangerous as people. Smirking, she turned the 38 until it pointed toward her bare thigh. Maggie scooped her long, red hair into a hairband, keeping it off her shoulders leaving it to dangle in a ponytail down her back. She braced her palms behind her, opening her body to the last of the day's sunshine. Maggie closed her eyes and breathed deep. <sighs> Tried to relax and enjoy the gentle breeze coming over the smooth lake water, revel in the gentle sounds of nature crickets, 
Birds. Maggie glanced at Tilly, her childhood friend, sitting across from her in the three-person boat. Tilly's short, blonde hair lay matted beneath her wide-brimmed straw hat, damp from the nearly 100% humidity. Groaning, Maggie remembered that she was the one who had asked Tilly for this girl's only weekend. Lately, her hometown of Cut and Shoot, Texas, had felt suffocating. And that was an oddity. Because normally Maggie couldn't get enough of the rat race, so to speak. Life in the fast lane. She was a hopeless adrenaline junkie, she could admit. Saying she loved to party was an understatement. A real whiskey sour girl who strutted to outlaw country and cozied up to cowboys who smelled of sweat, beer, and cigarettes. Maggie was living proof that the daughter of a politician could put those of preachers and cops to shame. When it came to her life as a hellraiser, she owned it unapologetically. But shame occasionally needled her conscience. Regretfully, she knew she was a disappointment to her father. And yet, despite her faults, she was still daddy's little girl and always would be. She emptied her beer and tossed the bottle aside. Here she was, in the middle of a lake, in the middle of Huntsville State Park, with nothing to do, or rather, nobody to do, which was what she thought she wanted. But now that she was here, doing nothing, with no loud music to talk over, no men to toy with, and... Maggie sat up. Getting to her knees, she inched toward the cooler on the center seat and dug through the ice. Only three bottles left. No fucking beer. What in the hell had she been thinking? Her nerves felt electrified. Tight. Vibrating. Like an addict itching for her next fix. Needed. What? To go home? Hell no. Not even close. So what did she need? More beer? A good lay? Hell yeah. God damn. She was really, really fucked in the head. So, why are we really out here? Just needed to get away. And I'm said to have a lurid affair with Matthew McConaughey. Sounds hot. Think Matt would mind if I joined in. Don't do that. I deserve better. And she did. They had few secrets between them. Tilly was one of the few people, next to Eric, that never judged. She could tell her anything, and vice versa. Dad's throwing a shindig this weekend. So? You go to his parties all the time. What's the deal? Maggie lifted her chin, gesturing toward the hard back beside Tilly. What's that you're reading? Tilly looked to the book, as if she'd forgotten about it. The Great Gatsby. What's it about? A guy who can't escape his past and struggles against a bleak future. Sound like anybody you know? <laughs> no, but it does sound depressing. <laughs> this month's choice for the book club. It's been some years, but... Luckily, I've read it before, so I brought a backup. She lowered the open book to reveal a paperback inside its pages. A thin dime romance. On the cover was a woman in a tight corset and billowing skirt in the arms of a shirtless, brawny man. <laughs> nice. So, your dad's party? Oh, come on. I showed you mine, and now show me yours. The party is for Stephen Walker. Didn't he just get elected for city council? Yeah, he did. Is he... An associate in my father's law firm. Uh-huh, and that's bad because... I just didn't want to go to this particular party. Can we leave it at that? Please? 
Okay, okay. She eyed the empty bottle by Maggie's bare feet. I'll get you another. Jags's empathetic ability was not without parameters. He'd have to physically touch someone to gain insight into their psyche, spirit, and sometimes their destinies. But this psychic ability could not be conjured or manipulated, not as easily as his empathetic abilities. Jags's ability to see the future paled in comparison to his unfiltered empathy. He found human beings entertaining, interesting. He truly cared for their well-being and reveled in their spirit. The ability to look into another soul was nothing short of fascinating and a feat that never lost its wonder. But it wasn't all fun and games. Jags had learned the hard way that some people were dangerous to read. His brother Cam had taught Jags that lesson. With a simple shake of Cam's hand, he'd pulled Jags so deep into the darkness that he fell into a coma and did not wake for almost two weeks. Ever since, Jags had remained vigilant and hesitant with regard to reading strangers. But he had to admit, finding restraint was oftentimes difficult, damn near impossible. Frequently, Jags's curiosity just could not be quelled. The sun was fading, falling numbly beneath the horizon of Interstate 45. Jags lowered the driver's window and spat out his sixth piece of gum. He fumbled in the open glove compartment. He found a tiny 1.8 ounce novelty bottle of Jack Daniels. He swigged it, tossed it to the passenger floorboard where it landed next to four other empty bottles. He popped another piece of gum, Melonberry Slam. A burst of fiery mint exploded in his mouth making his eyes water. With the heel of his hand, he dried the corner of his eye and relished in the more subtle flavors of strawberry and watermelon. With his window cracked, the whistling wind whipped Jags' long blonde hair about his face. He fumbled in the cup holder and found his Triskelion earring. Made of silver, the Celtic symbol consisted of three spirals rotating in symmetry. For some, it was a symbol of strength. For others, it offered hope in times of great adversity. Jags fingered the earring into his left lobe. Silently, he threw up a prayer to the Maker. He's not after me. I'll slow down, and he'll pass on by racing after some other poor soul. Ah, Maker's Hell! Jags, how the heck are you? Jags offered his hand. I've been better, big guy. Been better. That why you doing 95 and a 65? I'm worried about Cam. He skipped town without any explanation. Have you filed a missing persons report? Not like that. Just need to find him and make sure he's not up to no good, if you get my drift. <laughs> Jags, you don't do subtle very well. How can I help? Really? I owe you, man. You know that. You really don't. My little girl might not be here if you hadn't warned me about Daryl. Did you know we arrested him last week for solicitation of a minor? I hate it when I'm right. Daryl's reading offered nothing in the way of a vision. 
but his coloring was all wrong. A darkness. So dark. Almost vibrated with a deep purple. All wrong. I saw Rachel a few days ago. She was pumping gas at the tank and go. You know the one on Merrill Street? Yeah, that's right by the house. She's still mad at me. Sorry about that. Hope she wasn't rude. What can I say? She thinks she loves the guy. Fucking guy's my age. It's a scary world we live in. Enough about me. How can I help? I need to get to Sam Houston State Park as quick as possible. Alright, what you want to do is get off the highway. Here at the next exit. About three miles up. Take the old Thompson Road. Go, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile or so. Take that right, right there at Pete's Barbecue. I'll call Mike and tell him to give you a wave when you fly on by. He's the only officer patrolling that route. Thanks, Brian. I owe you. No, you really don't. He'd get there in time. It wasn't too late. 